The discussion surrounding the biggest animal of all time always comes back to one particular group, dinosaurs. Now it's a topic I've touched on quite a few times before, but one animal I haven't mentioned yet has probably caused the most amount of confusion as to whether the biological size limit for an animal, at least on land, is vastly larger than we typically fathom. So let's take a look at Amphicelius. So I'm going to change things up a little bit here by going into the description of the animal first because the story of its discovery and the fossil itself is actually integral as to why this is such a mysterious animal. Amphicelius is a genus of sauropod or long neck dinosaur and that is well it's the only part of this description that I can say with confidence. Now to say that the remains are limited is a hilarious understatement. Initially, this dinosaur was thought to have been a member of the Diplodocid family, having an especially long neck and tail, even for a sauropod, that were held perfectly parallel to the ground, along with forelimbs being slightly shorter than the hind limbs. Speaking of legs, Amphicelius was thought to have been particularly leggy for a Diplodocid, having relatively long legs in proportion to the body. Being a member of this family also meant that the size estimations were given using typical Diplodocid proportions. The numbers given for the largest specimen, A. fragilimus, was an estimated mass of 150 tonnes, as well as a hip height of 9.25 metres or just over 30 feet, and a total length of 58 metres or 190 feet. This is actually nearly double the length of the famous Argentinosaurus and today's blue whale. And then, much like Dunkleosteus, Amphicelius got a little bit chilly. Whilst Amphicelius is still a valid genus, the same paleontologist who came up with the size estimates for the largest species was named Kenneth Carpenter, and he re-evaluated this species and reassigned it to the new genus, Moreopunosaurus, citing differences that actually put it in the family Rebaccasauridae. Given this, he scaled up the proportions of the relative Lamaeosaurus, shrinking down the size estimates to 7.95 metres or just over 26 feet tall, and around 30.3 metres or 99 feet in length. This was revised again in 2019 by Gregory S. Paul, who gave estimations of 35 to 40 metres or 115 to 131 feet long and a mass of between 80 to 120 tonnes. Now despite the shrinking, this would still place Moreopunisaurus as at least the second largest sauropod of all time. But before we get ahead of ourselves, we need to take a look at the story of the actual fossil itself just to find out as to why this is such a mysterious animal. The first remains were found in 1877 by fossil collector Oromel William Lucas, who was hired by none other than Edward Drinker Cope. He found a partial vertebra in Garden Park, Colorado, and despite only being partial, it was huge, possibly measuring at nearly 5 feet tall, making the full vertebrae a whopping 8.9 feet tall. Subsequently, Cope named this as a new genus Amphicelius fragilimus, also citing notes he made from a huge distal femur. Now you might have noticed that I only gave possible size measurements for this fossil, and that's because it kind of got lost. Well, where'd you lose him? He ain't a set of f***ing car keys, is he? And it's not as if he's inconf***ing conspicuous now, is it? Somehow these remains disappeared from the face of the earth and have not been found since. Because of this, that we can only study this animal through second-hand notes of the original holotype until we find more material. This presents the very obvious issue when it comes to stating anything definitive, like calling it the biggest dinosaur, and that's the fact that there's nothing more than hearsay. The most sceptical in this discussion will often cite the more questionable aspects of Cope's personality when it comes to the actual validity of these size claims. If there was one thing that Cope cared more about than zoology and paleontology, that was his rivalry with Othmil Charles Marsh, who was equally as obsessed. It's subsequently become known as the Bone Wars, and it is just a crazy situation that I really recommend you find out more about here. Long story short with this situation though, Cope was somewhat notorious for cutting corners when it came to the scientific process, rushing things in order to gather as much material and publish as many papers to outcompete Marsh. Some have even speculated that he made the whole thing up and this holotype is a fictional hoax. But let's just assume that it was real and this is just a case of carelessness rather than a flat out lie. Kerry Woodruff from Montana State University in particular believes that this was simply a somewhat larger than average Diplodocus specimen and wasn't even as big as the notes would suggest. 
Given other measurements taken in his notes and level of carelessness, he suggested that the height of the vertebrae was actually a typo, being 1,500 millimeters when it should have just been 1,050 millimeters, making it around a foot and a half shorter. Now, considering this was an animal that was supposedly twice the length of a blue whale, it seems kind of strange that no other material has turned up in nearly 150 years, and the Cope didn't really talk much more about it, which you would think he would absolutely love to lord it over Marsh. To be honest, it's likely that he realised his mistake, and rather than facing the same sort of humiliation as what he did with the Elasmosaurus debacle, in which he placed the head on the wrong end of the body, he just kind of swept it under the rug. But this is all speculation, and for now, both Morea punisaurus and Amphicelius remain as valid genera, with the remaining species of Amphicelius altus being a much more well-studied animal with more specimens, coming in at a much more sensible size of 18 metres or 59 feet long, and around 15 tonnes in weight. So with that out of the way, let's take a look at where these guys lived. Both these sauropods hailed from the famous Morrison Formation, a land in North America from the late Jurassic around 150 million years ago. This area at the time was an arid one, being very much comparable with modern savannas, save for replacing grasses that didn't exist yet with low-lying ferns. Sporadically placed were also rivers, lakes, swamps and floodplains, occupied by various fish and reptiles such as early turtles and crocodilians. The dinosaurs occupying this area included famous names like Camptosaurus, Dryosaurus and Stegosaurus, along with theropods such as Ornithalestes, Torvosaurus, Ceratosaurus, the famous Allosaurus, and a giant I have recently talked about, Saurophaganax. But another thing that the Morrison Formation is famous for is its abundant number of sauropods. These included Camarasaurus, Supersaurus, Cathetosaurus, Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, and Brontosaurus. And also, yes, those last two are two separate genera. I do go into that more in my Apatosaurus video. The high amount of sauropods definitely stand out here, but most paleontologists seem to agree that this is possibly down to seasonal migrations, with all of them having different feeding niches. So this brings up the question, how did a supposed giant like Morabcunosaurus fit into this world? Well, taller flora wasn't exactly abundant here outside of riparian or riverside forests, so it's likely that that long neck came in handy for sweeping across low-lying ferns. The problem we may have had is that there are a lot of other sauropods doing something similar, so there may have been some potential niche overcrowding. I only say potentially because there are many animals in today's savannas with very similar but ever so slightly different enough feeding strategies that allow them to coexist. So it may have been a similar case here. Carpenter himself actually speculated that giant sauropods may have used the riparian forests as shade to keep cool during the day, and did most of the open savanna feeding at night. Next question is... What were the ecological pressures that made this thing evolve to be so huge? Well, if I'm going to be quite frank, I think we have a more pressing mystery to solve, and that is, did this dinosaur even exist? I do believe that Amphicelius existed as a much more modestly sized sauropod within this formation, but if I'm going to be honest, I'm very much on the fence about the existence of Moriapianosaurus. On one hand, Cope was a well-trained scientist, and I do believe that he found this admittedly large vertebrae. Plus, the reassignment to the Rabacosaurids, a group that wasn't even described until 1990, shows that features existed on it that weren't differentiated for over a century. So why put them in the sketches? But on the other hand, his hastiness for big finds did mean that he jumped to conclusions and might not have been above the odd mistake or even exaggeration. Plus the fact that something so large with such a similar feeding style to other sauropods being able to eat enough to maintain such sizes alongside them just doesn't smell right to me. Like I said, I'm 50-50 on the matter, and that is just my opinion. So I want to hear what you guys think. Did this thing exist? Let me know down below whilst I answer today's question, which comes from... Funadino? Funadino? We'll go with Funadino299, who has asked... How do we know Ammonite's appearance? I guess comparative anatomy enters here, but how did paleontologists come up with the consensus that we have today? I'm very curious because me and my friend love Ammonites and find it cute. They are cute and thank you for that, so let's get answered. So for those that don't know, Ammonites or Ammonoids are the poster child for fossils and are these spiral-shaped, often ribbed shells that we find all over the place in any formation before the Cenozoic. Now these shells take all sorts of shapes and sizes, ranging from a couple of millimetres to the size of tractor tyres. 
But in reconstructions, you usually see them as these very squid-like animals. Despite the fact that even with their abundance around the globe, not much in the way of soft parts were ever found. So we use a good old friend phylogenetic bracketing, citing the fact that their closest living relatives are nautiluses, having very similar anatomical features in the hard parts that are preserved. So the Occam's razor approach was taken and this was how they roughly looked right up until 2021 when it was all but confirmed. Using neutron imaging, paleontologists were able to see the parts of a specimen found in the 90s that were previously unknown, including a radula and beak, retractor muscles that allow propulsion as well as retracting back into their shells for protection, and even spermatophores, showing that it was a male. Another well-preserved specimen from the same year showed 10 tentacles complete with tiny hook-like suckers akin to squids. Uh, anyway, I hope that's answered your question. Uh, I'll leave a link to the papers if you want to give them a read yourself. And thank you to everyone else for watching. Please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed this. And I will catch you guys next time.